It's a wonderful song, isn't it? Isn't it a blessing? I want to thank you young people for all the labor and effort that you put in to be a blessing to this church. And I sat there and thought, man, God to have that song at his funeral. Amen. We've been blessed. Take your Bibles this morning to Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20. And um, Revelation chapter 20, we're going to be reading two or three verses and then preach a message today. Actually, Brother Danny was on line to preach today, and he is sick and called, and you be in prayer for them, please be in prayer for them. Revelation chapter 20, and I hope that you have your Bibles and that you'll read along with us today, and uh, ask, I ask you to be in prayer for this message today. I want to welcome those people that are online, and I would encourage you right now to call uh, your friends, your loved ones, your neighbors that may be lost and to ask them to uh, listen in to the broadcast today. Before I do get to preaching, I want to say to those online and some people here at church maybe not be, even be aware of this, but this uh, notebook is a, uh, has 52 basic Bible outlines. One of the goals of this church is to uh, teach the Bible and to uh, cause people to know the Word of God. You shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. And this is just 52 outlines of basic Bible doctrines, but it's very rich. And if, you don't, if you're online, I don't care where you live, if you'll call us here at the church. Uh, we'll send, these, send this to you free of charge. And uh, we want you to know the Word of God. It's just a helpful study. got thousands and thousands of verses on many, many different subjects in the Bible. How many has your Bible turned to Revelation chapter 20? It, would you stand as we read the Word of God in honor of the Word of God today? It's good to be visiting with you today as an interim preacher for how Brother Danny's gone. Okay. <laughs> I came and filled in for him today, and it's good to be with you, visiting, all right? All right, Revelation chapter 20, verse number 10. Does everybody there say amen, please? Amen. The Bible said, now, I want you to think about the, the, as the fact that we're in the 20th chapter of the book of Revelation. There's only two chapters left in the entire 66 books of the Bible. If you were standing around the, the departing deathbed of, of, of your grandpa or your grandma, and they said, I've got some last things I want to say to you, I think you'd probably pay it pretty, ten, pretty much attention. Somebody has said last words are some of the most important words we'll ever say. These are some of God's last words to you and I. And, be, and I'm so glad that after chapter 20, he gets into chapter 21 and 22 about the new heaven and the new earth. And about sorrow and tears and pain and suffering will all be gone. And talks about eternity. But in chapter 20, he says this. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. I'm glad to be able to read to you today that Satan, our enemy, the enemy of God, the enemy of your family, the enemy of your marriage, the enemy of your soul, will someday be cast into the lake of fire forever and ever. And he knows that, believe you me. And he's doing the damage that he can while he can. But his ultimate end is to be cast into the lake of fire forever and ever. And if that was all there was to this, it, it, we might say, well, okay. But as you go on through the chapter and you get into the, the re remaining part of that chapter, you find that there's a great white throne judgment. And this judgment is where people who have never received Christ as their Savior, they've never been reconciled, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. They've never been saved. They've never become a child of God through faith alone in the Lord Jesus Christ, death, born, resurrection, have been resurrected and stand before Almighty God. Now, I want to say today before I preach that you're, you're either saved or lost. Whether you're here, listening, it doesn't make any difference who you are. You're either saved or you're lost. You're not somewhere in the middle. You're either saved or you're lost. You either have a home being prepared for you in heaven, or there's a place called hell and the lake of fire that you're headed to. And the only thing that makes a difference is what you've done with Jesus Christ, the Lord. The Bible said, he that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. You either have Christ as your Savior or you do not. But I want to tell you this much. Christianity is not an intellectual mind game. Christianity is a faith from the heart 
We are to believe on and in the Lord Jesus Christ with our heart. The devils believe and tremble. Now, the thing I want to ask you today is where will you spend eternity as we read this passage of Scripture? And in verse number 14 of chapter to save time, the Bible said, In death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. You have never read, nor will you ever read, a more horrifying, fearful statement in your life than the fact that people who have rejected Jesus Christ doesn't make any difference how nice a person they were, but they, at the last judgment here, are cast into the lake of fire forever and ever. You've never read anything any worse than that. You, we can't even comprehend, I don't believe, with our final, and neither do we want to, it doesn't seem like, the awfulness of what we've just read. In chapter 21 and verse number 8, the fearful and the unbelieving and the abominable and the murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. God has a lot to say about this, and God is warning us today. Pray with me, if you will. Father in heaven, help us today to preach fast. Help us preach quick and clear and concise. And I ask, oh God, today I acknowledge you that I am so vile and so wicked and so undone. And I have no righteousness apart from the righteousness of your Son. But Lord, I come today in the name of Jesus Christ the Lord, our Redeemer, Lord, our, our Savior, our King. I come in his name today to ask you that you would send the Holy Ghost of God out from my being today as I preach thy word. Lord, you have included this in the Bible. You have said to preach the whole counsel of God. I'm asking God for your power today, and I'm asking Holy Spirit that you would preach on the inside of people's hearts and minds while I preach outwardly. I pray, oh God, reach out into the ends of this earth this morning to countries and states and cities around the world. And Lord, right here in this auditorium today, and I'm asking God today for such a great liberty of the Holy Ghost, for such a set free of the captives, that people will not be bound by their pride or the fear of man, and that they will flee to the cross of Calvary and flee from the wrath to come. Save the lost today, God, I pray, for your glory's sake. Reward the sufferings of your son. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You may be seated today. I want to preach today on the hell of hell. The hell of hell. The Bible said in Hebrews 9, 27, And as it is appointed unto men once to die, and after this the judgment. I've heard recently that there's many people dying across the country. I don't know whether there's any more than ever, but it seemed like there's a lot of people dying. Each of us will forever and forever dwell and exist in eternity. The fact of resurrection assures us that there is life after death. The question this morning is not, is there life after death? For we know that there is. The question is, where will you be after you die? Where will I be in eternity? We ask the question, why did Jesus Christ come down from heaven? Why did Jesus Christ suffer and bleed and die for our sins on that old rugged cross? Why was he buried? And why did he raise again the third day? Was it for a better marriage? Was it for a better car? Was it so I'd have help in raising my children? Was it so I could be healthy all my life? It was to save us from the lake of fire. That's why he came and died and suffered on that cross for our sins. He came to save you from hell. And I'm telling you, when people lose sight of this, we've lost sight of it all. To save us from the righteous wrath of a holy God. Jesus said in Revelation 1.18, I am he that liveth and was dead. I want you to listen to this today. And behold, I am alive forevermore and have the keys of hell and of death. I want to tell you why he suffered and died for our sins and rose from the dead. Was to save us and you from me and you from our sins and the penalty of our sins, and to keep us from dying and going to hell. I want to preach on this passage of Scripture today in Revelation 20 and 21. There are only 15 verses, but what mighty weight they carry. 
the hell of hell. Matthew 25, verse 46, and pay attention to me this morning, and don't let the devil donkey you around and miss what I'm getting ready to preach. Because I'll tell you, just as I'm going to give an account for what I preach, you're going to give an account for what you're listening to. You can mark it down in your day book. If God tells you to flee from the wrath to come, that means run from the wrath of God that's coming upon this world. In Matthew 25, 46, it says, And these shall go away into everlasting punishment. That means forever and forever. And I want to say that Isaiah 5, 14, listen to what God's word says. Therefore hell hath enlarged her mouth to hold the multitude going into it. Isaiah 14, verse 9 says, Hell from beneath thee is moved to meet thee at thy coming. Isaiah 33, verse 14 says, This is an amazing question. Who among us shall dwell with the everlasting fire? The Bible makes very clearly, not only in the Old Testament, but also in the New Testament, there is a real place called hell, and there is a place called the lake of fire. If there's anything that reveals the righteousness of God, now listen to me today. Everybody pay attention. If there's anything that lets you know the God you came to worship today is righteous, it is that he punishes sin forever. He forever puts sin away, but he has made provision for you and I to escape his wrath, and God warns us about hell. I do not and will not serve a God who will not punish sin, for he could not be a just God. He could not be a holy God. If there's no hell, and God doesn't send sinners to hell, then God is not holy. God is not just. If heaven is eternal, then hell's eternal. If there's no hell, Jesus is an imposter and a liar. If there's no hell, the Bible is full of lies. If there's no hell, there's no explanation for death, for life, for existence, for the cross, for the gospel, or anything that you're here about today. If there's no hell, we're gathered under false pretenses. But there is a place called hell, and it is a place of conscious, eternal torment. And I'm preaching today on hell and the gospel of Jesus Christ that you would not go there. Just that simple. You say, Reggie, what is the hell of hell? First of all, the, the hell of hell is worse than its creation. How, why and how did God create hell? In Matthew 25, 41, the Bible says, listen carefully to this. Depart ye from me, cursed into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. If you go to hell, you're going to go as an intruder. Hell was not originally created for you. Hell was created for Satan and his angels. But if you go to hell, it will be because you followed Satan to hell. You follow the devil in this world and in follow the devil in this life, you will follow the devil into hell. You're following the world. I'm telling you right now, the devil is a Judas goat. Back in the old days, when they had the slaughtering plants and the trucks would back up with the sheep there to unload the slaughtering plants, the truck would back up and the slaughtering plant had what's called a Judas goat. And the Judas goat was trained to run up through that alley and he would stand at the gate where the sheep were being let out of the truck. And when they opened that gate up, that Judas goat would look at him and bat, and then he would just trot down the alley, and those sheep, instead of having to be pushed out, would just follow that Judas goat right to their own throat cutting. Satan is a Judas goat. He'll have you follow him, he'll make you think you're on the right path, and he's leading you to hell. You listen to me this morning. The news media is a Judas goat. False religions are Judas goats. Evolutionists are Judas goats. Our governmental education system is a Judas goat that is leading multitudes to hell. Isn't it amazing? You can go to Education America 12 years and 16 years and even 20 years and nobody will stand in front of you and talk about a place called hell or even inquire where you're going when you die. They could care less as long as you pay your school bill. The devil is a Judas goat leading men to the slaughter pen of hell. Deuteronomy 32.22 says, Hell was kindled in the wrath of God. 
There's one thing you and I need to get back to, and that God is holy, 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 and sin does not dwell in his presence. The Bible said in 2 Peter 3, 9, the Lord is not slack concerning his promises as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us, word, not willing that any perish, but that all come to repentance. I've about had my cup full of these preachers and Christian people who bug me on Facebook about preaching repentance. I mean, some of the most supposedly educated theological jerks you've ever met in your life, they'll attack me for preaching repentance. You may tell you something right now. The Bible said the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent, the Bible says. I'll quit preaching repentance the day that God no longer has repentance in the Bible, amen. The Bible said the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. In the Old Testament, the word repentance was used as the word turn, and God would tell people, turn from your sin and turn from your wickedness. It means to turn and go the other way. And you say, well, salvation is of the Lord. But the Bible teaches clearly that even your repentance is a work of the Holy Ghost down in your heart, making you turn away from your sin to Jesus Christ. Amen. The Bible, I want to ask you something. This country's going to hell. I'm telling you, if we don't have a national revival, we're gone. You listen to me, the highest attribute, attribute of God, in the, if you were to ask the average church member in America today what the greatest attribute of God is, they'd tell you love. But that is not the truth. We've whitewashed God down to he's some kind of wishy-washy something, we don't know what. But let me tell you, the highest attribute of God is that's his holiness. His holiness is the highest attribute of Almighty God. You say, Reggie, prove that to me, I'll be glad to. Does God love everybody? Yes, he does. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. But is God loves everybody. Is everybody going to hell? I mean, is everybody going to heaven? They're not going to heaven. Everybody's not going to heaven. In fact, the Bible teaches most are not. But wait a minute. God loves us. Why aren't we going to, why isn't everybody going to heaven if God loves them? It's because he's holy and he will not forfeit his holiness just because he loves you. God will send you straight to hell before he ever forfeits his holiness. He'll send me to hell before he ever gives up his holiness. The greatest attribute of Almighty God is not his compassion, as great as that is. Not even his love and his grace and his mercy, as great as that is. None of that would be available without the holiness of Almighty God. God is holy and he will not forfeit it just because he loves us. God doesn't want you to go to hell and he's done everything that can be done to keep you from going to hell. Salvation is absolutely free. It is a gift. You cannot earn it, merit it, buy it, purchase it, do anything else. He gave his only begotten son. He gave all of heaven. He gave the best heaven had. He gave the only thing that would save us. I'm telling you right, God has done all that he can. The hell of hell is worse than his creation. If you go to hell, you will go to a place that was prepared for the devil and his angels. Secondly, the hell of hell is worse than its reality. I want to ask you, do you really believe in hell this morning? I'm telling you right now, Revelation 2014 will nullify every false concept and false doctrine about hell that's scattered from the Jehovah Witnesses, the Seventh-day Adventists, to the Roman Catholic Church. The Bible said in death and hell, we're cast into the lake of fire. You say, well, I don't believe in hell. Well, do you believe in the lake of fire? You see, I'm going to tell you, this country is full of nonsense. Let me just read something to you. Los Angeles... Time, the Los Angeles paper. I say, do you believe hell is a reality? Our silence in America speaks volumes about what we really believe. Here's an article out of the LA Times. Bill Ferris believes in hell, that frightful netherworld where the thermostat is always set on high. Look at the mockery. Where sinners toil for eternity in unspeakable torment. But you'd never know it listening to him preach at his South Orange County Evangelical Church. He never mentions the topic. His flock shows little interest in hearing about hell. It isn't sexy enough anymore. Can you imagine a preacher saying something like that? It isn't sexy enough anymore, said Ferris, pastor of Crown Valley Vineyard Christian Fellowship. One of the most well-known churches and followed after churches in the world. He said, we don't preach on hell here. 
In churches across America, hell is being frozen out as clergy find themselves increasingly hesitant to sermonize on Christianity's outpost for lost souls. There has been a shift in religion from focusing on what happens in the next life to asking what is the quality of this life. Harvey Cox Jr., an eminent author, I like those, they got them eminent, you know, they got to put them adjectives in front of their names. Author, religious historian, and professor at Harvard Divinity School said, quote, you can go to a whole lot of churches week after week and you'd be startled to even hear a mention of hell in the average American church. Hell's fall from fashion indicates how key portions of Christian theology have been influenced by secular society that stresses individualism over the authority of God. The human psych over moral absolutes, the rise of psychology and philosophy, and consumer culture have all dumped buckets of water on hell in America. Well, it's just too negative, said Bruce Shelley, senior professor of church history at Denver Theological Seminary. Churches are under enormous pressure to be consumer-oriented. Listen to me. Listen to me in this church. Churches are under enormous pressure to be, to be uh, 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 cultural, cultural down. He said that they, Christian, been influenced by secular society in that uh, uh, individuality. He said they downplayed damnation to grow in recent years, non denominational innovation with focus on everyday issues such as child rearing, career success, and they proliferated in loyalty. The churches has deteriorated. Here's what I'm saying to you this has turned into a con game in America. American churches are playing a con game, and especially with young married couples. Here's how to make more money. Here's how to have a better life. Here's how to have a better uh, intimate life. On and on and on and on it goes. And people die and go to hell. Log on to www.pastors.com, the website run by Lake Forest Saddleback Church, whose senior pastor is Rick Warren, one of the most famous preachers in America, says the Bible's teaching, he says, watch this, the Bible's teachings on hell guide his ministry. But if you scan the list of sermons for sale, there are sermons on abortion, addiction, ambition, laughter, leadership, and love, war, work, and worry, more than 350 topics, not one message on hell. They just don't want to hear about it. One measure of hell's continued decline can be found in the changing attitude of one of the most famous evangelists America's ever had, Billy Graham. Now, if this is wrong, I want somebody, I will gladly correct this if it's an error. But I would think that when this was written that his family would have said, hey, my dad never said that. In an interview... Uh, it said Billy Graham, who came to prominence in the 1940s as a fire and brimstone gospel preacher. His, depic his depiction of hell at that time was unequivocal and unpleasant address for unrepentant sinners. Even Graham has reconsidered hell, not whether it exists, but what it is. Quote, now this is, they got him in quotes. Whether he's, I mean, if he didn't say this, I will, I will stand up for him. But if he said it, I won't. I believe that hell is essentially separation from God. That we are separated from God so we can have hell in this life and hell in the life to come. That's not true. You don't have hell in this life. Graham told an interviewer in 1991, quote, But to describe hell in vivid terms like I might have done 30 or 40 years ago, I'm not at liberty to do that because whether there's an actual fire in hell or not, I do not know. Preachers are now questioning whether a merciful and kind and compassionate God could be so cruel as to send somebody to hell. Perhaps more than any other pastor, Reverend Robert H. Schuler is credited with inspiring the movement to supplant hell with feel-good messages. The Hour of Power televangelist is founder of the Christian Cathedral in Garden Grove. And I want you to notice something here. Now, you listen to me right now. I have, I have read to you about pastors, most of them in California. Where's California at today? California is where the preachers and the pastors went. Missouri will go where the pastors go. Are you listening to me? The Hour of Power Pelvate founded Christian Pilots in Garden Grove, a forerunner of the thousands of, of congregations that have popped up in recent decades to serve believers uncomfortable with the formality of old lying faith. Schuler is another believer in the concept of hell as an eternal separation from God, yet he said this, he stopped preaching on the subject 40 years ago, moving on to a theology that stressed individual success in such books, if it's going to be, if it's, going to be it's up to me. 
I don't want, ever want people to become a Christian to escape hell, Shuler said. And I could read on and read on. You listen to me, America's in trouble because preachers quit preaching the whole counsel of God. I don't want to get up every Sunday and preach on hell, but I tell you, I better preach on hell every once in a while. I had a man tell me, a pastor in this area, he was a long time pastor, and as far as I'm concerned, a great man of God. But the man said, Reggie, I'm going to tell you something. I was raising my kids in that church, and I got to notice. And he, he got to work. He said, he said, I was there when it started back years ago. He said he'd preach on hell. But he said, Reggie, he, well, he ain't preached on hell in years now. There's a tendency for pastors just want to be kind and compassionate and helpful and the daily lives and the pain and the suffering and everything. Can I tell you something? I don't care whether you're vomiting puke this morning. I'm telling you right now, God, that, you may need compassion, but you know what you need more than compassion? You need to be saved more than you need to be well. Amen. I'm telling you this much. So I'm talking about hell is worse than its creation, worse than, than its reality. The, the reality of hell of hell is worse than its reality. 50 to 98 percent of denominational people in America now do not believe in a literal eternal hell or a place of conscious torment. That's just what the devil wants. But the Bible said in hell, he lifted up his eyes, being in torment. Jesus spoke more on hell than he spoke on heaven. Revelation 21, 8 said, but the fearful and the unbelieving shall have their part in the lake of fire. The Jehovah Witnesses will come to your house and if you pill around and let them in your house, this is what they'll say. If your child disobeyed you, would you throw him in a fire? And you will say, no, I wouldn't throw him in a fire. And they'll say, well, neither does our, he neither does our heavenly father to throw us in the fire. The problem is they don't have a heavenly father. God does not send his children to hell, but you've got to be saved to become a child of God. If you're not saved, you're not a child of God. Their whole, you see how they twist and twist people out to where they don't believe in hell? It's an idolatry to conceive a God in your mind who's not the God of the Bible. I'm telling you in love and in tears today that hell is a reality. Number three, first of all, hell is worse than its, its, its creation. Hell is worse than its, than its reality, but hell is also worse than its location. Where is hell? Revelation 9-2 says there's a place called the bottomless pit. It's mentioned many times. Isaiah 14-9 says that hell is beneath our feet. You're listening to what the Bible said. Ezekiel 32-27 says they went down to hell. Where is down? Down is beneath your feet. It is where north, south, east, and west meet together. It's in the heart of this earth. These are, there's a difference between hell and the lake of fire. Hell is in the heart of the earth. The lake of fire is somewhere out in the universe. I don't know where. But the Bible said death and hell will be cast into the lake of fire. When a lost man dies today, his body goes in the grave, and that's all that goes in the grave. His soul and his spirit go to hell, but he has a soulish body according to Luke chapter 16. The Bible said the rich man died and was buried, and in hell he lifted up his eyes, being in torment. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I'm tormented in these flames. You can live your artificial life if you want to, but I'm going to promise you this book's going to be open on the great day of judgment. You're, I'm telling you right now, if you're not saved, I'm not up here trying to be mean. I'll tell you right now, if I was you, I'd get saved while I'm preaching. I would not wait another moment. And I'll tell you right now, you can, you can, I mean, you can look good, act good, you can pray, you can sing, you can do it all. I don't know where you're at, but I know God knows and you know today. And I'm telling you right now, if you're not saved, you need to flee from the wrath to come. There's a difference between hell and the lake of fire. Hell is like a county jail. The lake of fire is like the penitentiary. And the, the Bible said that when the lost man died there in Luke chapter 16, he, in hell he lifted up his eyes. Now you say, Reggie, what's going on? Listen to me. If you read that scene, you'd realize there's two sections in the heart of the earth. There was one that called paradise and the other was called hell. All right? When that man died, he, lifted up, he saw Abraham, he saw Lazarus over across the gulf in the bosom of Abraham. That tells, he said, there's a great gulf. They cannot come to us with good and we can't go to them. That was in the heart of this earth. You say, oh, man, that's wild. Well, you believe, you're, you, you come more to me and believe in a Hollywood movie than you do the Word of God. God said there was a place down there called paradise and the place down there called hell. And Abraham and Lazarus and those that were saved were in the paradise section and those that were lost were in the hell section. Now, here's what happened. When Jesus died on the cross and the man got saved, he did not say that today shalt thou be with me in heaven. He said thou shalt be with me today in paradise. Why didn't he say heaven? 
Because when Jesus died, he went to the heart of the earth and he led captivity captive. The man before the cross could not go into the presence of God. And here's why. Because the blood of the Lamb of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, had not been applied to the mercy seat of the true tabernacle in heaven. And no man could go into the presence of God. And paradise was a place of holding for those till the Messiah came, died, resurrected, took his blood and put it on the mercy seat. And at that moment, Jesus went into hell, and went to heart of the earth and led captivity captive. And David and Abraham and all the saints and Abel, all of them went with him. To, and he took, that's why Paul said, when he was come along, he was caught up into paradise. Your Bible will tell you what's going on. Jesus took paradise to heaven. Now all that's left in the heart of this earth is hell and the bottomless pit. Molten liquid lava beneath your feet of 9,000 to 30,000 degree Fahrenheit. The earth is 25,000 mile, miles in circumference. It's spinning at just a little over 1,000 miles an hour. Okay? I want to show you how accurate the Bible is. It has a crust 6 to 10 miles thick. There's a force that no one can really explain. It's called gravity. And it pulls everything to the center of the earth. This earth is 4,000 miles in diameter. That's through, okay, the center. You cut a hole right here this morning and drop through the crust of the earth. The average gravitational pull on a 165-pound human being at 12 hours is 1,980 miles. That's almost, that's 20 miles from center core of the earth. But there's a problem. The earth has been spinning. It becomes exactly what God called it, and that is a bottomless pit. Yeah. Bottomless pit. I want you to, I'm, I'm going to tell you something. I don't like, I don't like preach on this, but I'm telling you one thing. Danny called me. There you go and said, Ridge, I'm not going to be able to be there Sunday. And I just figured, well, I'll preach on the Feast of Pentecost. Looking forward to it. Let's grow in the Lord. I was in my study last night studying, and I am telling you, it's like the Holy Spirit of God. And I'm sorry, and I'm worthless, and I ought to have been in hell. And I don't even know why God, I can never imagine why God called me to preach. But he just said, Reggie, put it aside. I want you to preach on hell. I want you to preach on hell. Reggie, it's been too long since you preached on hell. You got kids growing up in that church, Reggie, you ain't heard about hell. I love you people. I want you to do well in your business. I want you to have a good job. I want you to be happy. But I sure don't want you dying and going to hell. What good is it all if somebody dies and goes to hell? The earth is turning and spinning, and it's exactly what the Bible said. It's a bottomless pit. The hell of hell is also worse than its condition. You say, Reggie, what is hell like? You know, I, I understand preachers don't want to preach on things. Who wants to sit and listen about hell? Life's got enough rough stuff, enough tough stuff, but I'm telling you, the fact of hell is a reality. And I'm telling you, if you don't have anything else in this world but Jesus, you're a very wealthy person because there's people underneath your feet this morning that are screaming and weeping and wailing. Would give anything to sit where you're sitting this morning and have a chance to repent and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. The first thing the Bible teaches us about the condition of hell is the fire of hell. He said, I am tormented in these flames. Are you listening? There is true, real fire and flames in hell. And I'll tell you right now, you can take, your, the, the, you can take the hand of your soul and try to wipe away everything I'm preaching this morning and the Holy Ghost of God dealing with you right now. And you can try to wipe it off and say, well, I'll get out of here. I don't, not yet. I don't know why I'm bothered. I'm telling you right now, if you're bothered and the Holy Ghost of God is dealing with you, I would not wait till I got done preaching. I'm telling you, I'd bow my head. I'd, I'd turn around and get on my knees before God and say, God, I don't care what Reggie thinks and nobody else in this church thinks. I'm not going to die and go to hell. God, save me for Jesus' sake. There's fire in hell. Are you listening to me? I never will forget house burned down here south. And I went over there two or three days later, and I'll never forget walking in the ashes of that fire and the knuckles, the bones of those people that burned in that fire. I can't imagine the awfulness of being in a place forever and forever and forever where there's flames and fire 
nonstop. Can I tell you this morning, whether you like it or don't like it, people that died without Jesus Christ, that's where they're at this morning. Yeah. And you not wanting to come to grips with that does not change that. It may make you feel better about things, but it doesn't change their torment. Right. And it's sure not helping those who are following them down. It sure isn't helping when preachers get up at funerals and preach people into heaven that they know, have no, as far as anybody knows, are not saved. Act like there's no hell. It's a place of torment. It's a place of pain. It's a place of brimstone. It's a place of weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. Down in the Valley of Hinnom where Jesus was overlooking while preaching, they had the Valley of Tophet, and this is what happened to Israel, and this is what happened to America. They took their, by the way, they sacrificed their sons and their daughters unto devils. And I'm telling you, they had a valley called Tophet. Tophet means drums. And those old pagan priests had the big drums, and they beat those drums. There's a reason they beat those drums. It was to drown out the screaming and the weeping and the wailing and the gnashing of teeth that was going on in that valley. And let me tell you, nowadays we're walking into an abortion clinic. But back in those days, because they did not want to have to raise that child or feed that child, or that child take a little bit of the way of the fun and pleasure of their life, they took their children down to the Baalistic altar there, the, 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 to, to Tophet, and, and, and they would take that he had a arms that you, you can see in history the, 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 you can see the, the image of this thing and they had these arms and they would throw their babies up into the hot, hot built this huge fire underneath there and the hot and then they would throw them babies in the arms of that go, brass god Moloch by the way he's still around in America yeah. Yeah. this is exactly what's happening in abortion clinics yeah. Yeah. it's sacrificing our children to the devil's of our own personal pleasure. And they would throw them babies up in there and those babies would be caught in those arms and the heat, those babies would scream and the mothers sometimes would wail and gnash their teeth and weep. And the babies would scream and they'd beat those drums. And then they had this system in it that they would take dogs and they would take those dogs and throw them in on top of the fire and the dogs would bite each other and you could hear their teeth popping. And Jesus was trying to teach us what is beyond this life in the next world. And when he did it, he looked down into the valley of Hinnom where those people knew what had went on. And he said, in hell there's weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. We're living in America right now. Nobody wants to come to an altar anymore. Nobody wants to be seen weeping. We're so stinking cocky proud in this country. It is puking sick. Nobody weeps over souls anymore. Nobody wants to think about somebody dying, going to hell, much less we don't think ourselves. I am telling you right now that the hell of hell, though, is even worse than the condition of hell. There's thirst in hell. He said to dip his finger in water. The Bible said there's no rest, day nor night. And by the way, there's beast in hell. You're in Revelation chapter 20. I want you to turn back to chapter 9 with me. I want to show you what's in hell. You want to know what's, you want to know what's, that you're not going to find this anywhere else. Revelation chapter 9, you're in the tribulation period here, okay, on this earth. Now, I will tell you this. There's going to be a point right here is where hell does come to earth for a little while. Are you listening to me? Now, I guarantee you they're going to know when hell hit earth. Revelation chapter 9, the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven to the earth, and to him was given the key to what? The bottomless pit. And he opened the bottom of his pit, and there rose the smoke out of the pit, the smoke of a great furnace. And the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. Now, are you understanding right now what hell's like? It is a place of smoke, of great furnace. The sun and the air were darkened by the reason of the smoke of the pit. Verse 3, and there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth, and unto them was given power as the scorpions of the earth have power. And it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing nor any tree, but only those men which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. So watch verse 5. And to them was given that they should not kill them, but that they should be tormented five months. And their torment was as the torment of a scorpion when he striketh a man. And in those days shall men seek death and shall not find it and shall desire to die and death shall flee from them. And the shapes of the locusts were like unto horses prepared into battle and on their heads were the crown of gold and their faces the faces of men. And they had hair as the hair of women and their teeth were as the teeth of lions. Let me tell you something. Listen to me. God Almighty is telling you the kind of creatures that are in hell. Either you believe it or you don't. But I promise you. It's like God said, 
Verse number 9, they had breastplates or breastplates of iron, the sound of their wings as the sound of chariots and many horses running into battle. Watch verse 10. They had tails like unto scorpions and there were stings in their tails and their power was to hurt men five months. And they had a king over them which is the angel of the bottomless pit whose name is in the Hebrew tongue Abaddon, but in the Greek tongue his name is Apollyon. One woe was passed and behold there come two woes more hereafter. And the sixth angel sounded and I heard a voice in the four corners of the golden altar which is before God. God, saying to the sixth angel which had the trumpet loose the four angels which are bound in the great river Euphrates and the four angels were loosed and they prepared an hour and a day and a month and a year for to slay the third part of men and the number of the army of the horsemen were two hundred thousand thousand I heard the number of them and thus I saw the horses in the vision and then they set on them having breastplates of fire of jacinth and brimstone the heads of the horses were as the heads of lions and out of their mouth issued fire and smoke and brimstone. And by these three was the third part of men killed by the fire and by the smoke and by the brimstone which issued out of their mouth. And their power is in their mouth and in their tails. For their tails were likened to serpents and had heads. And with them they do hurt. That's what came up out of hell. The bottomless pit during the tribulation will come up out during the tribulation period. Now you listen to me. You're one heartbeat away from eternity. One heartbeat. If you died right now, where would you be? It's serious. You listen to me. I am not going to stand before Almighty God. And you come up as a witness. And say, I came up at that church, Reggie. And you never told me about hell. You just talked about, laughed, told jokes, and had a good time. And you look at me and you say, Reggie, you didn't preach on hell. You didn't tell me what it was, and now I'm going. I'm not going to have you look at me like that. I'm going to look back and say, I tried to tell you, don't go to hell. Repent. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. He's your only hope. America was a great nation when America's preachers preached on hell. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. How can you get on down the road when you haven't even started? Mark chapter 9 and other passages of the New Testament. Now I'm telling you right now, if you don't think this is real, Jesus said these statements repeatedly. He said you'd be better off to have your eye plucked out and enter into the next world with one eye than have two eyes and be cast into hell fire. He said, if your hand's offending you, you'd be better off to have it cut off, your foot offending you, cut off, and enter into the next life maimed than to enter into hell fire having all your faculties. Did you know that rich man lifted up his eyes? The Bible said he could remember, he could taste, he could think, he could see. You see, I don't understand that. I don't either. You talk to God about it. All I know is that you're an eternally created being and you're going to spend eternity in heaven or hell. What would you do with Jesus Christ? The Bible said, for the worm dieth not. I've, had, I've, had, I've heard preachers so ludicrously say, oh, that's talking about your memory. Where did they get that? They did not get that out of the Bible. They read somebody's stupid commentary who doesn't want to believe on hell. Where the worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. Day and night. Tormented day and night. They have no rest day or night. Tormented worms. Let me tell you what I get out of that deal about the worms. Where the worm dieth not. That, that even though that fire has torment, it doesn't even kill, it doesn't cause a worm to be consumed. You're not annihilated. Your seventh-day ad friend is friends. Believe you go to the grave. If you're not saved, that you're just annihilated. You just burn up like a matchstick. They're lying to you. I don't care if it's your grandpa. He's lying to you. He don't believe the Bible. You say, Reggie, you really mean what you're talking about? I'm going to tell you right now. If I didn't believe what I was preaching this morning, I would quit preaching. The one thing I ain't, the one th I'm a sorry, low-down, worthless, hell-deserving dog. But I'll tell you one thing. I ain't in the play game business with this preaching stuff. I mean to be, if this Bible teaches it, it's true, whether you like it or not, whether I like it or not. Amen. Have you trampled on the blood of Jesus Christ? 
The hell of hell is worse than this darkness. Matthew 8, 12 says that they were cast into outer darkness. Listen to me. Not utter darkness, outer darkness. Luke 13, 28 says, These, There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth when ye shall see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God and yourselves thrust out. The Bible implies that those that are in hell can see where they could have been. The rich man was in hell and he could see where he could have been. The awfulness of knowing, seeing where you could have been just because you rejected the Lord Jesus Christ. It's the most insane thing a man will ever do. The hell of hell this morning, folks, is that is forever and ever. Of all the bad things I can say about hell, it's creation, it's reality, it's location, it's condition. The worst thing I know about hell, you go there, you're never getting out. You're never getting out. I love you. I don't want your money. I can live without your friendship. But I can't live without telling you the truth. The hell of hell is, I don't want you to ever forget this, that hell is forever. And you go there, you're never coming out, except to be cast into the lake of fire. I want you to think with me this morning, if I were to have two of the biggest men in this church come up here today, if I had Kenny James come up here and Sam Waltice, and they took one of these little bitty kids, and there was a lake of fire, and that little kid screaming and say, no, don't do this, don't do it, don't do it, and those men took that baby and threw him. Can you imagine, one angel killed 185,000 Assyrian soldiers one night, and the Bible said angels will cast you into hell. Why does the Bible say they'll cast you into the lake of fire? Because you're not going to want to go. And I'm going to tell you, you may be real prim and proper here this morning in church, and you may say, well, you'll never see me down at that altar weeping and wailing. Well, I'll bless your heart. We're going to see you weep and wail when they get ready to cast you into the lake of fire. You're going to find, no, no, God, no, God, no, God, no, God, no. But all your screaming and all your hollering, you're going to lose your prim and properness and your pride and your, your little, you know, your, your, your structure. And you're going to beg God Almighty. But I'm going to tell you right now, that's what the Bible says. Whosoever's name was not found written in the Lamb's book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Where are you at this morning? I never will forget. And I'm not much on dreams. The Bible's got a lot about dreams in it. I don't live by dreams. But boy, I'm telling you one thing. It's caught my attention. I dreamed one night, Brother Ralph, that one of my children, one of my children, was being pulled out of my arms by Satan and being drugged toward hell. And I'm telling you, you talk about it, it's just like, it felt like kill you. And I remember I was trying to hang on, I was trying to hang on, I was trying to hang on. And I pulled him, and they were, kept pulling him away from me, kept pulling him away from me. And I was on the ground, and I was screaming, and I was begging. And there's these great big iron doors. And those iron big iron doors just swung open, and all you could see the flame and the smoke and the demons down in hell. And I'll never forget, they pulled that child out of my arms and through those doors, and those doors just sort of... <laughs> and I remember I just slumped on the ground. God, they're gone. God, they're gone. I don't want any of you kids to die and go to hell. I mean it. I don't want you to die. I'm telling you, you got me serious. You say, Reggie, you believe in dreams? Well, I'll tell you one thing. Man, that dream helped me get serious about eternity. Let me just close by saying this. Nobody dies in hell. If death could go to hell, they'd crown him king. It's called eternal torment, everlasting. There are no exit signs in hell. I want the pianist to come. There are no prisoners escape in hell. Hell has never had one prisoner escape, ever. Pay attention. There will be no drugs, no liquor to escape the reality of hell. 
There will be no suicides in hell. You can't kill yourself and get out of it. There's no fresh air in hell. There's no water in hell. There's no streams in hell. There's no flowers in hell. And figuratively, the doors are welded shut in welded beads. You're here and you're here forever. Liquid waves of fire splash against the walls and they seem to say, you're here forever. The devils hiss and mock and say, you are here forever. Beasts sting and torment and with every sting, it seems to say, you're here forever. Satan himself mocking you, you followed me to hell and you're here forever. The weeping and the wailing. And I don't care if the ghost of hell dance at your funeral and the preacher preaches you straight into heaven. That is not going to take care of the fact that you died lost without Jesus Christ. Someday, I'm going to preach my last message from this pulpit. And I want you to know I love you. I love you, children. If hell's not real, I'm done preaching. What am I preaching for? I just want to tell you this morning, be a good day to get saved. I don't know what, I don't know what the future holds. And I know the Lord's coming back. And if he doesn't come back, I know we're dying. And we're going into eternity. I don't want you to die and go to hell. I know the pressure preachers feel. They don't want to have negative services. But I want to tell you, your car won't run without a negative post on its battery. And I'll tell you something else. Somebody says, Reggie, why are you so excited about being saved? Because I'm not going to hell. And I'm not going to hell not because I've been good. I haven't been. I'm not going to heaven because I've preached or served the Lord. I've done a poor job of that. I am going to heaven because I have Jesus Christ as my Savior. He died in my place for my sin. And I have received him as my Savior. And I'm trusting what he did for me. And I've received the gift of eternal life. I don't say I'm not going to hell arrogantly, braggadociously. I say it humbly, but oh, happily and gratefully. I'm sure glad Jesus died for me. That's the only way you're going to go to heaven. When this thing's over with, I want us all to be there. Amen? Amen. I want us all to be there. Let's stand together with our heads bowed. Listen, I'm not going to monkey around a lot here today. I'm just going to say this to you that if you're not sure that you're saved here today, why don't you just step out, get out of that seat and come on as the pianist begins to play. Fall on your face before Almighty God and say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Let me tell you what's going to hold you back, and that's your pride. Saying, oh, what would people think if I finally admitted that I'm not saved? Don't let Satan trap you in your pride. Don't let him trap you in the fear of man. Would you come? Would you come today online? I want to talk to you folks online across the country today. I wish you had a good church to go to. And if you get a good church, you find church, you get there. All right, you listen to this thing later. But if you're listening to me right now online, I'm telling you, turn around. Get on your knees right there at that couch or that chair you're sitting in. Bow your head before God. And say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Place your faith and trust in Jesus Christ as your Savior. If you don't, you will die and go to hell. It's not a joke. It's not a fear tactic. It's nothing other than the fact of the Bible. Would you come this morning all over the... I want to ask a question today. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed, and I want serious business here, and I'm not, I'm not mucking around. If you're here today and you know by the basis of the Word of God and the Spirit of God that you're a child of God through faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ, that you've been born again of the Spirit of God, would you lift your hand up and say, Lord, thank you for saving me by your sweet grace. Would you do that today? Would you do that? Say, Lord, thank you that I'm not going to hell. Amen. Thank you that I'm not going to hell.
You may put them down. There were many here today who could not raise your hand. And I'm telling you something. I want, I want you to be saved. I'm asking you today. If you're here today and you say, Pastor, I could not raise my hand. There's a war going on in my heart. Please pray for me. Listen, I will honor that. I will not betray your trust. I will pray for you. Would you slip your hand up high where I can see it and say, Pastor, pray for me. I'm concerned about my soul. God bless you there, sir. I appreciate your honesty. I'm telling you, God bless you back there. I see your honesty. Is there other hands today? You're just being honest about it. We're going to pray here in just a minute. Other hands, get in on this prayer. There's power in prayer. Would you lift your hand and say, listen, pray for me. Listen, I, I'm just going to tell you something. I don't want to go to hell. I got to love enough love of my own, uh, love himself. I do not want to go to hell. I'm glad God made a way I go to heaven. I see that hand there. God bless you. Is there another hand somewhere else? Another hand, quick, up, high, where I can see it and pray. All right, here's what I'm going to do. Listen to me carefully. I am going to pray as I told you I would. While I'm praying, I'm going to ask those of you who raised your hand, if you'll step out, just find you a place to pray somewhere around the front and say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I want to receive Christ as my Savior today and ask God to save you. And let me say something to you. All that come to him, he will in no wise cast out. He'll turn nobody away. He'll receive you as his son today. We're going to pray. Father in heaven, I pray now for these that raise their hands. Lord, I promise them I'd pray. And God, I'm praying right now that you'll break through. And God, that anything that's hindering them, God, would be just tore down the strongholds that the devil has on them. And God, that they'll come to Christ and to the cross of Calvary today and that they'll be saved. And God, just trust alone in what Jesus Christ did. Lord, not in how good they are or will be or are or was, but God, knowing that they have no righteousness of their own. And God, the only righteousness you accept is the righteousness of your son. Oh God, I pray, take the binders away from the eyes and make men see clearly the cross of Calvary and make them see the empty tomb and a dying, bleeding Savior who died and paid the cost of sin in their place. Oh God, I pray today for these who raise their hands. Save them today. And God, there may be others, Lord, who should have and who haven't. And God, I'm praying don't let them rest. Don't let them have any peace. Disturb their souls, Lord, till they've come to the cross of Calvary. And I'll thank you for what you do in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Brother Terry, uh, Coates, I'm going to ask you to come. Uh, man, would you pray with, right here? You need to come today. Come on. Come on today. Don't hesitate. Listen. You say, well, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Listen. Don't gamble your soul. Don't gamble your soul. I'll tell you what. Neighbor boy of mine. Listen to me. Neighbor boy of mine. 13 years old. Was laying in bed. Had a gas leak in his house. On a cold winter night. Died sleep in his sleep. Never any profession of faith of Jesus Christ at all. Died without God. Young people here, if you're, if you're young enough to understand that you're a sinner and that Christ died in your place, you're, young, you're old enough to be saved. Amen. Today is the day of salvation. I don't know. All I know is God burdened my heart to preach this. I don't know what's going on. All I know is I want to be obedient, but I'm begging you in Jesus' name, do not walk out of this church house lost. There are people in hell this morning give anything to have the chance you have here today to be saved. They'd give anything. Would you come? Just step out. I'll, I'll tell you the truth about it is, I got a little experience of this. God will meet you on the way, amen. God will meet you on the way. You step out of that seat, God will meet you on the way. I know people that got saved before they ever knelt their knees at an altar. God, God save you so fast, make your head swim. The moment you open your heart and say, God, I'll receive you as my Savior, God, the Holy Ghost will birth you into the family of God. He'll save you. Would you come? I don't know. I just feel like God is just pulling. I feel like the Holy Ghost is just dealing. Please pray. I tell you what, we've got to have the power of the Holy Ghost. I'm thankful people that pray for the power of the Holy Spirit. Let me tell you something. There's a power that needs to go, go above all this power of the devil, lying to people, keeping people from coming to Christ and keeping people in the bondage of their fear, keeping people in the pride and fear of man. I ask you to come today. People are praying here at this altar today. Amen. Would you come? Would you come? I'm going to obey God here. I'm going to ask everybody to bow their heads, close your eyes, just in reverence for other people. But here's what I want to do. I'm going to make you a promise. You're here today and you say, Reg, 
Pastor Rich, God is dealing with me, and I can tell it. I've got barriers. I, I don't even know. I can't tell you why I haven't come forward. I can't tell you why I won't come. But I'm battling in my soul. I'd really appreciate it, just between me and you, if you'd pray for me before we leave this service today. Would you put your hand up high where I can see it? And I promise you, I'm going to be praying for you this week. God bless you there. I see that hand. I'll be praying for you. I see that hand. God bless you, young lady. I'll be praying for you. Is there another back there somewhere? Across this auditorium from one side to the other is another hand. I'll be praying for you. I'm, I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to laser in. I'm going to remember you. Pray for me. Now I'm going to follow the Lord. One more deal. Are there here in this auditorium today men whom God has called to preach? And you just need to say yes to God. Let's, let me tell you something right now. Don't ask God what's ahead. Just ask him for today. Don't say, God, show me what it's going to be like. You don't know and I don't know. Can I be honest with you? It'd probably be pretty rough. But you'll never have the peace of God and the joy of the Lord until you surrender to God. Is there a young man or man here today? You just step out of that seat and you say, Pastor, I'm coming today. I'm going to, whatever God wants me to do, whatever he says to do, I'm going to do it best I can. God's not looking for your ability. He's looking for your availability. He takes stammering people like Moses. He takes rough people like Elijah. He takes cussers like Peter. God bless you, young man. God bless you. Amen. God bless you. This is so sacred business now, folks, with people. This is sacred business. Sacred business with God. Somebody else here today. America's going to die because we ain't got preachers. I'll just tell you the truth. America will die because we ain't got preachers. I want to ask you another question. Maybe you're a young lady here today and God has spoken to your heart about working in missions or serving the Lord in some capacity and you want to really give your life. We've got some wonderful ladies here in this church who have given their life to Jesus Christ to serve the Lord here at this school and in other capacities. But I tell you something, there's, there's something about yielding and saying, God, I will yield to you. Oh, Isaiah said, here am I, Lord, send me. I wonder if there's some young lady back here today, this is your time, this is your day of commitment, this is your day of surrender. If you'd step out and say, dear God, I'm available. You show me, I'll follow. You lead, I'll follow. You tell me where to go, I'll go. What to do, I'll do it. I just want to be obedient to your call in my life. Is there someone like that here today? You just want to step out and have a sacred time of prayer with God today at these old altars. God, I'm coming. I'm coming and giving my life to you today, Lord. Amen. Amen. You see, there's preaching and then there's time when you need to preach you need to shut up and let God work. We're going, to, we're going to go a little further with this today. I have a burden. I have a real burden. I'm going to start off with daddies. Are there some daddies here today? You mean well. You love the Lord. You love your family. You love your wife. But you know that there's not a commitment to Christ like there needs to be in your life. You're not as close to God as you need to be. You're not as dedicated. You're kind of just drifting along. And today, the Holy Spirit of God is saying, you need to tighten up. You need to tighten up your walk with me. I'm going to ask you to come, fathers, daddies. Just say, I want a closer walk with God today. God bless you there. God bless you there. Uh, there's some mothers here today who are not praying with your children. You're not reading your Bible to your children. And you're busy and you mean well and you love your God and you love your husband and you love your children but your personal walk with God is just not what it ought to be and you know it would you come would you just step out and say God I need you I need you Lord God I need you would you come would you come today 
I'm not trying to get people to just have a move to have a move. I just want God to do what he wants done here today in our lives and in our hearts. God bless you there. God bless you. Amen. Boy, I'm going to tell you something. We need these times of tightening up with God. We need these times of revival, the moving of the Holy Spirit of God. Oh, God, I want to draw closer to you today. Lord, I want to, I want to get where I need to be. Man, life can draw you out. Life can drain you. Life can just drain the sap out of you. I know what I'm talking about. I'm a preacher, and I'll tell you what, if I ain't careful, I just get, you know, just get tired, and you get weary, and, and you just like, you know, I just want to do what I want to do. It's not too late today to be saved. The door's still open. But I do want to say something. You're not going to get saved when you feel like it. You're going to get saved when the Holy Spirit of God convicts you and draws you. That's when you'll get saved. Except the Spirit draw, no man can come to the Father. If the Spirit of God is drawing you today, you need to come. I'm serious with you. I was traveling to Iowa. Preacher revival meeting. Got up here just north of Lebanon, Missouri, following a big log truck. Had a load of railroad ties on. I just followed him around the curves, and all of a sudden I saw this car coming. Little blue Plymouth. 16-year-old girl in it. She went off to the edge of the road on the right, and she swung back too hard, and she hit that semi head on. It was just like a bomb went off. And she was dead in eternity before I could get my car stopped. Sickening. Her mother sent her down to the store to get a loaf of bread for supper. Gone out into eternity. I hope you all live to be 99. But I tell you one thing, you got no promise. And by the way, the days that God gives us will be sweeter and fuller when we're really right with God. Anybody else need to do business with God? Can I tell you something? I've been at this a long time. There comes a time when the Holy Ghost lifts. That dove will lift off a of service and he'll say, I'm done. And those who responded will be the blessed. And those who reject will be those that will leave here with a troubled heart. Don't leave. Don't let the dove lift. God bless you, young man. God bless you. You say, Reggie, I'm tired. I need to get home. I do too. I'm tired too. But I'm going to let God do what he wants to do. I am. If you're, if you're elderly or tired, you need to go or you need to, nobody's going to feel bad at you if you sit down or go out. That's not, we're not here to torment you at all. But I want you to think about the people in hell today, what they'd give just to stand where you're standing, to endure what you're enduring. They'd trade places with you in a heartbeat. Now here's what we're going to do. People are praying, and we're going to, I'm going to pray and dismiss the service. I'm going to ask you to joyfully. Now you might want to just hang around, but I'm going to ask you to joyfully, if you're right with God, to leave and quite quietly, and we'll be back tonight. But um, you may get back here at the door and something just click, and you turn around, come on back in, we'll be here. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the presence of your Spirit here this morning. We thank you for the reproving of the Holy Ghost of sin and righteousness and judgment. We thank you, Father, that you are a holy, righteous God. Lord, you would be unjust if you did not punish sin. But, oh, God, the fact that you punished our sin in your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, ought to motivate us to love and to serve and to live for your glory's sake. God, I pray for all these that have come this morning to pray, whatever the need may be, whether it's for salvation, whether it's, Lord, for strength, for dedication of service, surrender, Lord. I pray, God, today that you will just literally do a good, deep, complete work of the Holy Spirit in each heart and each life. And, Lord, I want to pray especially for these two that raised their hands to be prayed for after we've left here today. Oh, blessed Holy Spirit, 
I am so glad that no man can run from thee, that you're there before we get there. Lord, that you're there, and I pray that you will just speak to them and deal with them and stir their hearts. Lord, I read in the Bible where it said the Spirit of God stirred their hearts. God, stir our hearts, I pray. Bless them, Heavenly Father, with truth and righteousness and salvation. Lord, I pray for every daddy and every mother in this congregation. Help us, God, to take our faith seriously, to put you first and above everything. God, knowing that everything else will line up, God, I pray, Lord, that you give us a spirit of willingness to suffer for righteousness' sake in this church. And I pray that you'd give us willingness to be reproached for the name of Christ, that we'd rather suffer reproach with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Lord, I want to thank you that you made a way that we could escape the wrath of God. Thank you for the gift of eternal life. Thank you for salvation free and full and forever. Oh, God, what a wonderful thing that just as hell is forever, salvation is forever. Thank you for that, Lord. God, I love you. I appreciate your help this morning. Pray that I didn't get in the way. Oh, God, may they see Jesus. May they see Jesus at this church, I pray in his holy name. Amen. 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 Before I just say go, has anybody got anything they want to say today? Anybody got anything you need to say or you just feel like you need to get it out? I just want to give you that opportunity. Anything? All right. Amen. Young man, did you get things taken care of? Yes, sir. Amen. It, it, God gives peace, doesn't he? Yes, sir. Amen. Did you get saved today? Yes, sir. Amen. Jordan's your name, ain't it? Yes, sir. Well, that's a good Bible name. My yes. soul. Jordan, I want to tell you, we love you. Before you leave today, some of you might want to come by and shake his hand and tell him, tell him you're glad we've got a new brother in Jesus today. Amen. And I want you to know I love you. And uh, just have a great day in the Lord. Be, be, if you're saved and you know it, clap your hands. Amen. If you're saved, you know it, be good. Amen. <laughs> if, I, 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 do not want, I do not want nobody going out of here except those that didn't obey God. If you obey God, you go out of here happy today, all right? You ain't got no reason not to go home happy. So we'll see you tonight. God bless you. The beans is burning. The carrots.